Walmart Plus members save on meeting up with friends. Save on having them over for dinner with free delivery with no hidden fees or markups. That's groceries plus napkins plus that vegetable chopper to make things a bit easier. Plus, members save on gas to go meet them in their neck of the woods. Plus, when you're ready for the ultimate sign of friendship, start a show together with your included Paramount Plus subscription. Walmart Plus members save on this plus so much more. Start a 30-day free trial at walmartplus.com. Paramount Plus, a central plan only. Separate registration required. See Walmart Plus terms and conditions. People are driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. With over 350 million global monthly visitors, Indeed's matching engine helps you find quality candidates fast. You get to ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. It's not just about hiring faster, though. 93% of employers agree Indeed delivers the highest quality matches compared to other job sites, according to a recent Indeed survey. Don't search. Match with Indeed. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash podcast. Just go to Indeed.com slash podcast right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash podcast. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Hey folks, it's the Unsung Podcast, I am Mark Oh, the words are back The words are back That's nice How did it feel going back to that? Feel alright Aye? Yeah, I don't hear that You don't feel that you're wasting your energy? No, who am I joined by? I'm joined by you, Chris You are joined by me uh, Who am I joined by? Uh, you're joined by Kyle Chris, Kyle, Kyle and Mark Kyle Wood, Lovers Turn to back Monsters again. Both a person and a band, a bit like Bright Eyes. With so on. Um, often conflated with Conor Burst alone, but actually a little bit more than that. Uh, you probably know that because you've been listening to the last two episodes. Mm-hmm. If you haven't been listening to the last two episodes, go and listen to the last two episodes. Uh, we've broken it down, we've gone through a little bit of the prehistory, we've gone through the, the catalogue, and we are quite quickly now going to dive into Digital Ash and a Digital Learn, which has been brought to the table by Kyle as... The most unsung of the Bright Eyes records, despite acknowledging, I think, that it was pretty close to the bottom of most lists in terms of the best Bright Eyes records. For sure. For sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, let's take a little tour of the material on this then. Cool. Let's get into it. And before we wade into Digit Lash and the Digit Learn, I think there's a couple of like uh, elephants in the room we should mention. Uh, I know that 2016, his older brother Matt died. Uh, in Connor's own words, uh, he basically fucking drank himself to death. Well, later I got to say that was not quite. It wasn't quite clear what happened in a later interview. He said right, but it, it affected them quite a bit. Mm-hmm. And the following year, he got divorced for his long term partner as well. This is also a couple of years on the back of something we alluded to the way at the fucking start of the first part of this. We were talking about poor Matthew Kelly, um, mm-hmm. the rape allegation or rather the false rape allegation against them that was withdrawn by uh, the woman that made it uh, so she, she called it 100% false I'm not sure what the motivation for that was however I am aware of the fact that there's always an asterisk against Conor Oberst's name that has lingered on the back of hearing about that at the time and it's that thing of like mud sticks you know mm. doesn't matter that he was completely exonerated that the person said there's absolutely no truth to that allegation 
And he came out and he actually was quite gracious about it Saying, you know, the vast majority of these things are true I don't want to be any part of a conversation that says We should be sceptical about women reporting these things I was unlucky, this is a rare example of a false allegation It's been resolved, I've spoken to the person, it's done I don't want to be held up by some men's rights groups As saying, you know, women are just out there to bring men down That's actually a very fucking admirable response to that But it is amazing that for me, I just knew I had a nagging doubt about the guy and it is based on this, Mm. despite the fact that this is actually completely taken care of. That is a testament, I think, to the the, the sullying power of of those kind of things. I I think um, songwriters of that ilk in particular are very problematic people in the sense of you know, drug, drink abuse, whatever. Um, there's certainly live videos of Connor being very kind of all over the place. He clearly struggles with his mental health. So when there is an allegation like that, it's hard not to be like, well, he seems like a head case. Of course he's going to have done something like that. You know what I mean? It's, it's, when you're it's, in the public eye that much, though, I mean, there's going to be videos. I mean, this guy has lived his life publicly for mm-hmm. about 15 years at this point since he's sort of broken through to, you know, touring with Bruce Springsteen and going on late night TV shows mm-hmm. and, you know, calling up Emily Harris to fucking just come and play music with him. I mean, at that point, your life is documented. You go for a sandwich and people are like, fucking hell, Conor Roberts getting a sandwich. <laughs> it's going to, you're going to get caught at moments that are an opportunity and you'd be able to build up a picture of anybody that has that much material of them living their lives highs and lows that could make them look either like a wonderful person or Mm -hmm. like a fairly odious person but what matters is that the allegation in the words of the person that made it was completely false and it's kind of important I think to try and remove that now for the conversation and just say we've covered that it's addressed that should not factor into your thinking about Conor Roberts whatever you think about his vocal style whatever you think about him drinking whatever anything like that the rape allegation was false the person says it's false end of story with that said let's go and talk about Digital Ash Ash and Digital Learn and the Digital Learn Mm -hmm. So, first of all, there's a few notable inclusions in terms of collaborators here. You've got Nick Zinner of the Yeah, Yeah, Yes, does a fair bit on this. Uh, you've got Maria Taylor of Azure Ray. Uh, she does vocals in a few places. And Nate Walcott does a lot of stuff. Nate Walcott went on to do films and things. He did the uh, Fault in Our Stars, did the soundtrack for that. But he's also done records with... Beck, The Shins, Maroon 5, U2, they have the whole... The Chilies, that's how they, get, that's how they yeah. managed to get Flea and John Theodore, Theodore on, yeah. on, that, on that record. Um, I think the record itself qualifies as Indietronica, and Bright Eyes have never been Indietronica up until this point, but it very much is. There's lots of, in particular, I look for like heavy compression and gain on snare sounds. They do that kind of plight, augmented drum stuff, maybe even some of it's sampled. Um, or triggered um, the synthy pads that are early on they actually really put me in the mind of that uh, you know, that post Bill Berry R.E.M. album Up which opens mm-hmm. with um, uh, is it a track called Airport Man I think mm-hmm. it is Great that kind of weird Light synth use There's nothing edgy about it um, As I say the drums really processed um, The production comes much more To the fore, plays a more active role uh, I think as a result This invites a lot of comparisons with Sparkle Horse who really veered Into that sound uh, You know tracks like Apple Bed from It's a Wonderful Life In 2001 I wish I had A horse's head Tiger's heart An apple bed No, I would suspect that Conor Oberst quite liked Sparkle Horse I'm jumping to that conclusion but that came out three years prior to this four years prior to this actually and I would wager that there's maybe at least a part of him was somewhat influenced by this developing scene of Indietronica bands in particular like your postal services and, and like Sparkle Horse and stuff like that 
But uh, in terms of taking a wee tour through the tracks, I've already said that first one time code does. Uh, yeah, it's Airport Man from Up. A very sort of gentle. Well, Airport Man's not entirely instrumental, but it's almost instrumental, and it's just a little atmospheric kind of warm thing. things off yeah it's an intro isn't it um, and the co- the, straight away the chord progression and the keys is very bright eyes like you know you're still listening to bright eyes it's still the exact same signature style of, of writing um, yeah a lot of this record feels like the beefed up version of the lo-fi stuff you know with the drum machines and the synths mm-hmm. and all that it feels as though this is like the fully realised end point if bright eyes had went in that direction it would probably have been something like this you know back at, back at the start of their career even the way the samples are deployed in this, or the crowd sounds and all that, it's very bright eyes. It's just deployed in a new way. Yeah, it's a nice, quietly atmospheric song, which I think... Yeah, rather than opening with like a kind of almost a skit, though, he opens with something that's quite downbeat. Mm. And, you know, it's in keeping with the tone of the record. And the theme. Yeah, and mm. the theme. Um, Goldmine Gutted, the second track. The drum mix is fucking wild in this song, man. I, well, see, my first note is that I really enjoyed the, the drum mix and the panning in this one. It's, it's two night. drummers. Two drummers playing the, same, sli- the slice, same beat, yeah. and it's just slightly slightly out of sync it's in either channel. It's, it's a really nice beat. Yeah. It's a really nice uh, bit of writing, the, actually. The, a lot of the, the drums, I think, are one of the best things about the entire album. Like, Yeah, it, it does stand out way more, the drumming in this, than it has, even on Lifted, which yeah. you were talking about. Um I think the chorus in this one actually is a really cute bit of sad melody. The only beef I have with it is that I would have really loved that third organ note to ring out instead of just cutting the way they do. It's just, it's a musical decision as I was saying that I don't share because actually I think the chorus is quite a nice payoff but then the fact that you just don't sustain that third note they pull it off I'm like ah come on let it resonate but hey the synth bass sound is really good in this I think generally over the course of the whole record I know you say they're kind of polite synths but I think those sounds are really well chosen and it works really well for them um, the, the bit with the vocal uh, from the sidelines I see you run I really fucking love that bit and it was a really really catchy wee bit um, something quite affecting about the way it's delivered as well, which is at odds with the kind of digital sound that's mostly going on around about it. But mm. yeah, the drum thing is, is really cool. I found it quite distracting at first because mm. it's like... Well, it's on headphones yeah, in particular. Yeah, uh-huh. it's, it's very, very noticeable. And I was like, this is kind of strange because it's... <laughs> are my headphones out of sync? That's good on you. <laughs> you know? um, the third track in it, Arc of Time. Until the clock speaks up Says it's time to go you can choose the high or the lower road. Nicely arranged, pretty subtle as a tune, and actually it's really poppy, this one. Um, the main melodic hook in it didn't really grab me all that much, but the delivery of it is really nice. So you nurse your love like a wounded dove in the covered cage of night. Every star is crossed. I couldn't help but think that this one sounded like an Indietronica Paul Simon (laughs) (laughs) And there's something wrong with that? (laughs) Perhaps not Uh, No, I I really like this one as well Um, I actually did enjoy the vocal and the melody on it There's some off-kilter harmonies or vocal double-tracking that happens in it Which I think is something that Connor does deploy from time to time he he likes to sing over his own vocal Mm -hmm. a lot Mm -hmm. and it makes that weird like it's never a perfect match and he enjoys that it's it's like the Elliot Smith thing it's been Mm -hmm. a recurring theme throughout his career singing over his own voice and just leaving all the little uh, it's it's something I again I do creatively and then going into a studio or working with a producer who doesn't get that vibe and then I'm like I do a take and they're like you kind of like went over a bit there and I'm like yep 
<laughs> that's designed that's the, yeah I mean because it, it would go against a lot of production instincts yeah for sure yeah, yeah. cause whenever somebody wants to double track the vocal it's like it's got to be exactly perfect yeah. it's yeah. also you would often submerge one more but he keeps them loud enough that they kind of trip y- over y- each yeah, other exactly. sometimes yeah exactly I think there's I think that seems to be Again, you were saying co- can be quite distracting, but I think production wise, I think it's all supposed to sound like it's tripping over itself, like this yeah. entire album. Oh, no, I think that's like, him. he's done it so many times, it's clearly a deliberate yeah. thing. Yeah. Down in a rabbit hole. I heard you fell into a rabbit hole. Cover yourself up in snow. Baby, tell me. I actually thought that this song was a reference to someone being obsessively lost in the internet but then there's a reference to drug use in it and I suppose the two can go hand in hand the song itself I just found it a bit glum it didn't really connect <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, reminds me of um, there's a, an interview with Connor kind of like how he's on uh, Craig Ferguson I think it is and uh, he, inter- he gets interviewed and it's the most condescending interview you can ever possibly imagine and uh, he asks him what type of music well, like, what do you, he's like what do you like what do you like and Conor Robert's like oh listen to like a lot of Leonard Cohen and he leans in and goes awfully sad isn't it <laughs> 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 like, that is very Craig Fox isn't it um, glum, glum just the word glum, glum. Seems, <laughs> but, I mean it is kind of glum I mean it, he's done this thing as well where they've, they've used some quite fancy strings yeah they're but, real strings as well Yeah, they're offset against this lo-fi electronic glitchy feedback noise that they keep using. So you've got a bit of the high tech and the low tech there, which is an interesting mix. I, I just don't necessarily think there's much of a song mm. beneath it, you know? I like that aspect of it. The beat is kind of hip hoppy as well. There's a really heavily processed guitar solo, which I quite enjoyed. Um, it's an element that I think works really well when it's nestled underneath the strings in this song. Mm. And then there's a female vocal around three minutes, seven which is doubled up and it just keeps going it's a really lush outro I, I like this song I like the ambition of this song it makes sense for the people that are written lifted to kind of try and bring in some elements of yeah. that grandiosity you know uh, take it easy, fifth one, this was a single. First with your hands, then with your mouth. A downpour of sweat, damn cotton clouds. I was a fool, you were my friend. We made it happen. Uh, beneath the production of this, I think it sounds like a really archetypal Bright Eyes song. The production is really ramped up though, and it's trying to differentiate it. Uh, there's a fun we I think it's like almost like a whistle sound that has the bit the playfulness of a band like Granddaddy, so it's a little bit lighter in tone as a result. I think um, that's one one of the tracks that uh, Jimmy Tamborello done the electronics on it, like ah, right, from okay. the Postal Service, which right, again okay. makes sense of yeah. the, the differentiation between production on that standing out. I think it's probably like the weakest track on the album, yeah. but, but it's a single, so... Yeah, it's, it's, it's an odd <laughs> choice because Hit The Switch, the sixth track, is the one that I recognise from repeated play in the wider world. It's mm-hmm. like in a total cafe song. It does the same thing with the drums as track three with the two different drummers playing variations of the same beat. Why, why do you think that wasn't chosen as a single? It may, may have been to do with the Jimmy Tamborello being a part of like Take It Easy, like I guess like Postal Service and on the name or but I mean, surely like but Bright Eyes is already a bigger deal than Postal yeah Service. then 
And Hit the Switch is probably the my favourite Bright Eyes song. Yeah, oh, okay. It, it's just a really it's just a really standout stick on single candidate yeah. to me. And it is yeah. the fact that it's one of those tracks we, we spoke a wee bit again, sorry to bring up REM, but the track Star Sixty Nine from Monster was never released as a single, but it got radio play mm-hmm. because people just wanted it to get played. And this to me is similar. It's like I hear this regularly on playlists, um and yet it's never been used as a promotional yeah. tool for the record. It's it's just kind of strange. I like the richness and the instrumentation in this one. It's just a really captivating song. It's got a harmonised guitar solo with two completely different guitar tones, which is lovely. I think, again, with the, when I'm speaking about the weakness of it, I think um, I was saying at my like kind of first point of opinion on this album lyrically like i i, I recognize conor oberst has a very certain style that doesn't fit a lot of people some people can, can roll an eye at it or whatever but i think there's like a real a difference in the lyrics on this album like there there seems to be like a lot more weight and a lot more mm. kind of thought and i think take it easy obviously feels a bit more as you said like archetypal like it's just fell out of him and he's been like Get that one on the record, boys. <laughs> yeah, no, like I said, I, I think Hit the Switch is a better song and those elements that I mentioned definitely are more interesting than what happens and Take It Easy. Uh, talking about elements, uh, I believe in symmetry. Mm-hmm. If you do not like Conor Oberst's voice, this is not the track for you. So I raise my glass to symmetry, to the second hand and its accuracy, to the actual size of everything. The desert is the sand. You can't hold it in your hand. It feels like more like a traditional bright ice tune almost. Yeah, I mean, but this is a much more interesting drum panning. You know, that's that's a kind of technique that's very much of this record. Um, there's some cool guitar work at the end, actually. Yeah, tremolo it, stuff is really good. Yeah, it's complemented by strings that give it a bit of an epic air. Uh, it seems like a lot of energy went into this tune. So again, it's a little bit odd that it isn't a promo. But in terms of, you know, as as a song itself, I'm not massively moved by it, but I do recognise that they've poured quite a lot of effort. The the way the strings are mixed in this song makes it kind of feel as though they're like a bubble around the song. You know, it's a really interesting production track because they're, they're submerged, but not. I think it's hard to submerge strings, really, because cause they are, take up so much like, it's like a, space. It's like a good word, I'd say, for this album in general. Like, submerged, it, does, it feels very... Like, it feels like Hangover, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it does. It totally <laughs> it's does, like this, like, yeah, like, you'd know. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I really like, I, I, I like those guitar parts at the end as well. Um, the different drum beat thing, it, it keeps happening, and by this point I'm kind of used to it, and I really, really, I was really getting into the way that's done. Walmart Plus members save on meeting up with friends. Save on having them over for dinner with free delivery with no hidden fees or markups. That's groceries plus napkins plus that vegetable chopper to make things a bit easier. Plus, members save on gas to go meet them in their neck of the woods. Plus, when you're ready for the ultimate sign of friendship, start a show together with your included Paramount Plus subscription. Walmart Plus members save on this plus so much more. Start a 30-day free trial at walmartplus.com. Paramount Plus, a central plan only. Separate registration required. See Walmart Plus terms and conditions. People are driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. With over 350 million global monthly visitors, Indeed's matching engine helps you find quality candidates fast. You get to ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. It's not just about hiring faster, though. 93% of employers agree Indeed delivers the highest quality matches compared to other job sites, according to a recent Indeed survey. Don't search. Match with Indeed. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash podcast. Just go to Indeed.com slash podcast right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash podcast. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. So... Devil in the Details, uh, track eight. I think it actually has a really decent hook in the pre-chorus. That no backing out bit that drops out. Mm-hmm. 
does that again later on with different words. The harp's a kind of interesting inclusion. The song's totally fine, but again, I think it's a very typical Bright Eyes four chord progression. It probably has a fair bit of poignancy for fans of the band, um, it's safe to say, but you know, that Spanish phrase, toca la patata, doesn't really touch my potato. Man. <laughs> it doesn't really move me. I, li- I really like that song. It's kind of a lot more introspective. It feels like it's underwater almost going back to that kind of submerged feeling it's also and I think it's in 3-4 um, and there's like white noise creeping around the edges of the whole song which again make you feel like it's in a bubble no I really like the feel of that song I've something about it that I just gravitated towards mm-hmm. you know I mean I have to say I, by track 9 ship in a bottle I'm getting a wee bit mired <laughs> in the the low key melancholy I wanna be the house that you were raised in the only place that you feel safe I feel the record could have used a wee bit of a gear change here. The lyrics in this one are simple but cute. You know, that, that stuff about wanting to be the shower that wakes you up in the morning but instead just being uh, the weather at your window. Some really nice turns of phrases mm-hmm. there but the tune itself for me is a total shrug and I'm getting a wee bit tuned out. <laughs> you know, I was going to say that's one of my, one of my fav- faves on it probably, strength-wise. <laughs> There we go. That's the kind of plurality of opinion that you've seen it in this podcast for. It reminds me of Elvis Costello in places with the upstroke guitars, like a really kind of eighties feel. I, I don't know where that thought came from. I don't even know if he would ever cite Elvis Costello as an influence. Well, I can see that probably. Um, it's like just from a songwriting perspective. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, it's cool. It's a kind of a subtle, it's kind of a subtle song in places. Yeah, the baby cries though. Yeah, that's always uh, uh, like it's like a, such a stupid <laughs> thing, but every time it happens, I'm like. <sighs> Done it again, boys. <laughs> you know, like you were saying you thought someone was in the house earlier on because yeah. of the footsteps in a song. Did you think you'd had a win? <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank God. Um, track 10, Light Pollution. So this is probably the gear change that I think could have come earlier. Yeah. Johnny Hudson was a good man. He used to love the books and marks down. Now he's It's sort of a light rocker, you know, it mm. shakes things up a bit. As I was saying though, I think when Indytronica tries to rock out, it, it feels quite constrained. Mm-hmm. Like it's like the guardrails when you're bowling. You know what I mean? It's like you can never really go too wrong. And freedom yells. The production style kind of hampers it a wee bit, so never actually get heavy or raucous. So when I say it feels rocky, I mean that in a very qualified sense. The drums are still really heavily processed, and you know you can hear there's electronic percussion comes mm-hmm. in this quite a bit. But yeah, it doesn't get as noisy as it feels like it wants to be, and melodically, I didn't get any real emotional punch. I do think the ending is quite nice, though. The ending of the song is pretty strong. It is, yeah, more straight song, I think. It's more emo than anything yeah. else, that one. It didn't really grab me too much, if I'm honest, either. Um, it feels as though it needed to go up another gear. It does have a fun build-up around 1 minute 56, but I felt as though it needed something a bit more. Um, it's my favourite song in the album. Is it? It's what? <laughs> it's my favourite song in the album. It's what? your favourite... <laughs> you know, the gate's going to cut that out, so just be loud and proud. It's, it's my favourite song in the album. Why? I think I, I, there's just something about the chorus... I'm obsessed with the lyric, there's no hell when you die, so don't look so worried. It's mm-hmm. um, a good lyric, to be fair. Yeah, just the way everything builds up around the chorus. The sims are all like swirling, and again, it feels kind of like the idea of it being submerged when the chorus comes in. Like it feels. It breaches and gets into the fresh air. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, theme to Pinata, uh, the eleventh track. Is it a little bit of a Latin? see? This is what I was waiting for. The strain in your voice, as you see, as we get to each ne- next track. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so yeah, Latin jazz or something when it kicks in. My, I mean, this song just does not happen for me at all. It feels completely pointless. I'm sorry, and it, I would just 
go straight into the Easy Lucky 3 as a 12th track. I'm definitely a little bit drained at this point because it's a 50 minute album. And I think 50 minutes, as we've probably established on the show, is beyond my sweet spot, especially for subdued music like this. I think, I mean, same with Pinata, I didn't need to be on here at all. Uh, this, I mean, I think that the last track, Easy Lucky 3, is definitely both a bit better and a bit That's more, my favourite song on the record. Yeah, yeah it's, and a bit, it's a lot more interesting than a, a few that precede it. I kind of wanted to give it a fair hearing But I reckon if it had come sooner It would probably fare better as a tune Because I'm just a bit fatigued That said, the melodic choices We're different songwriters and consumers Clearly, I just The choices he makes don't really make sense to me Or they do make sense But they don't push any buttons Well, Easy Lucky Free I think that was quite a well-known single as well Yeah, wasn't yeah, it? for sure Listening for It's just, it's just a really good song I think the keys are great The overall synth sounds Are really well chosen The lead guitar And the verse is awesome it's, Again the drums are Like a major Major part of it as well Yeah It's got the strongest Vocal melody I think On the record The the bridge The way the bridge Goes into the chorus Is quite 80s The synth sounds Are quite 80s Which is cool It's just a, The chorus is simple But effective for me And no I really It's a strong end To the record But I think You know I'm kind of with Chris In the the sense of like 50 minutes is probably too long I'm a punk guy So like 30 minutes Is like always going to be My sweet spot I'm a fan of 42 That seems to be my It's an odd one for me Because I'll argue and be like Oh this is too long I want like Short sharp songs But then like I listen to a 52 track Sebado record (laughs) (laughs) I think like Contrary yeah, that's the mm. word. Yeah, that is Arsehole. Arsehole. <laughs> <laughs> and no, I think I, I think I enjoy wading wading through things. Is is doesn't it, everybody? I mean, you like baths. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah you exactly. Just like being submerged. In yeah, things, don't you? Like I, I enjoy, and I think that album, knowing the context of it as well, of like losing losing a friend and whatever, and trying to kind of navigate your way through that, it feels like it's maybe obviously they're not a band that love a short album, but. I think that one's it's supposed to kind of feel like w- wading through the like through an endurance. Yeah, yeah. Which I think is an interesting thing when it's done purposely. Uh, it can work like really, really super well. So, so do you just want to hear my conclusion? Yeah. On bright eyes, hmm. want to wrap this up. This is what you've been waiting for. <laughs> <laughs> this is what it was all about. Did you put money on this? We hope. <laughs> <laughs> I think with regards to this record, I think after years of hearing this sort of production. You know, the, the, the more Indietronica thing Including plenty of bands, I think, spending far too much time Focusing on that and not on the tunes You know, actually relying on it To mask the tunes sometimes I have actually I, I've ironically learned to tune this sort of Approach to production out It, it doesn't impress me, I think it, it was Probably pretty striking at the time But those kind of things move fast You know, and the novelty of This may have felt even slightly cutting edge But it certainly doesn't feel Slightly cutting edge now, so I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to put myself in the headspace of 2005 to try and give it a fairly balanced appraisal. Um, it was certainly a bit of a bold move by the band to do this, um, albeit it was a bold move that, as I mentioned, a lot of other bands had already taken three, four, five years prior to that. They probably enjoyed it as a break mm-hmm. from their norm. They also had the safety net of having another album out at the exact same time that had more of their conventional sound to it if people didn't click with this. But given that the production doesn't really strike me as particularly remarkable now, listening to it in 2024, I don't feel there's an awful lot of great songwriting behind it. There are moments, but there's a lot of really quite standard Bright Eyes stuff that I just feel like Conor Aberst could write with his eyes shut. As I said, more generally, the melodic decisions that Bright eyes make just don't marry with my own preferences or instincts. I can hear how someone would relate to it and be moved. I can see what it's doing. You know, I'm not blind to that. Um, but those those changes, those decisions, those transitions, they don't resonate with me, barring on a few rare occasions, and I've kind of highlighted some of them as we've gone along. As a reference, I think I had that same issue where a lot of Sparkle Horse, more generally, but they clicked more regularly with me and when they clicked they really clicked with me in a way that Bright Eyes has never done so yeah yeah but Bright Eyes to me 
are, especially during this record, are in a similar place in terms of what they're going for, but it's an inferior product. Mm. Um, I've really enjoyed listening to Bright Eyes this past week or two. I was sitting here last night, Kayla, I was kind of dreading it. Um, I always get that when I come to, when it comes to artists with large, larger catalogues because it can stop being fun. Doing this can stop being fun really quickly. Um, <laughs> Again, I'd also just like to at this point say that you said to me, I thought you would have chose like Guided by Voices. Yeah, I wish would yeah, have been... Like, good luck with that. Yeah, kind of, <laughs> that 36 that, albums yeah, or that's, something. That's, yeah, that, was, I, that, that was the fear. Chris, Chris that is way off. It's... I think I think they've got fifty two studio albums, and that's just under the name "Guided by Voices." Shitting hell! Yeah, that's the one. Uh, Mark, Mark, shut your mouth! Yeah, because <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew you. I know you like. I know you like "Guided by Voices," and when I was speaking, like, speaking of wading through things, yeah, I was, and when I when, when I suggested maybe getting you on the show to Chris, I was like, you could do "Guided by Voices," and I, I knew when I said that I was like, I really don't want to do "Guided by Voices." <laughs> <laughs> I really don't want to do that, um, or fucking and the Mountain Goats or something yeah. as well, you know. But that being said, Spark Horse I really enjoyed, but because this plays more my sensibility mm-hmm. as a as a musician, as a as a consumer of this kind of music, as somebody that likes both old country and emo, like this ticks all the boxes for me. Mm. And then you get some weird shit like this, which is cool too, yeah, and, sure. and and makes the it makes the journey worthwhile. You know, I don't think it's their best record. I probably would say that as the the unsung record for mm-hmm. sure. What um, do you think's their best record out of Kiros? I think Lifted is probably their best record. Okay, the seventy-one minute album. Yeah, uh-huh. from the guy that likes thirty-four minute punk rock records. Yeah, that's 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 the irony, isn't it? Like it's fucking contrary bastards by the as, two years. As you know, like when whenever when I'm listening to a discography of a, of an artist, I listen to the album we're doing last, but also as I'm going through it, I'll just like pick songs I like it mm-hmm. immediately and put them on a playlist. Okay, most of them came for Lifted. Mm-hmm. So. You know? I, if I, you'd asked me before this show to guess, I would have said, I think Marco really liked this. And so I think. I did like it. You did like it. Mm-hmm. But I just mean, even the band more generally. I know you said you kind of went, you, you got into them and then got out of them pretty quickly. But it does, to me, make sense that, that you would enjoy this. Did mm-hmm. you think I was going to like it? No. <laughs> that's good that's good that you came into my house yeah. uh, knowing that you'd pick something that you thought I was going to dislike that I've now talked about for two hours and that I had to study for a full fucking week yeah thanks definitely that was the vibe so how's your hangover you prick <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean I didn't hate it I didn't hate yeah. it I don't hate yeah, I think, eyes I th- and they've I th- got th- some good moments I think like knowing the art you create and all that I knew it would maybe not be to your sensibilities but I knew that you would be able to like recognise the pros of it and like where Conor Roberts fits in the kind of grander scheme of things yeah. and all that so How has it felt for you getting back to Bright Eyes and discography? <laughs> he's <laughs> fucking 24-7 <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> It's funny that it's kind of like uh, again I was speaking earlier about watching all the Martin Scorsese's films I was like watching them I was like why am I watching all these again I've watched these so many times <laughs> yeah. like He yeah. is wallowing in a big old bath of Bright Eyes <laughs> Yeah You know So And I, again and I was like I, I thought unsung podcast over here I was like I've listened to all the solo albums listened to Commander Venus listened to Park Avenue you have done none of that yeah. <laughs> no I have mate and trust me look at the fucking lines in my face man. I have I have this week totally caught you're, up you're, you're really it's, you seem very glum <laughs> tell you what I've done though I have done a really rather excellent nexus I did mine this. with a hangover this morning so it's not going to be that I, good I tried to do one with a hangover and, and then f- fell asleep failed. for yeah. two hours <laughs> right fair enough <laughs> totally fair enough nexus time then A complicated series of connections between different things. This week's Nexus was chosen by Davy Bright. Fucking Davy Bright, man. Oh, Davy Bright, Bright Eyes. Eyes. What are the chances? I'm sure he's never heard that before. And uh, the person picked for it uh, is Ron Atty, um, a performance, performance artist. artist. Uh, and a lot of like sort of reflections on S&M and extreme body art. He shoved a baseball bat up his arse. That was a thing he did as part of an, an does, art exhibition. Does that count as extreme these days? <laughs> That's what I was saying to Danny. Because Danny, <laughs> Danny was looking, she was like, I, I said, have you ever heard of this guy? Because I know he's done body modification and she's a piercer. Yeah. And she was like, no. And then she Googled it and it's like, 
nah, I've not heard of this guy, but I don't. No, but I, I mean, don't really want to hear this gonna, guy. I was going to say extreme. What was everybody else doing last night? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to make it out that he's a freak show because I mean, some of it does have a bit of this uh, Jim Rose thing to it but at the same time a lot of it's also very strongly about pushing back against the conservative right in the states it's about lgbtq rights and and platforming and visibility so it's high art you know it's it's got some very complicated shows and stuff and he's collaborated with a lot of different people so it's not a pure oh my god look at that fucking weird guy with a bat up his ass it's, this is not like two girls one cup this is like a really interesting performance artist mm-hmm. who's, who's done a lot of really cool stuff and stood up against a lot of pretty odious people as as well um, but uh, Kyle you brought this to the table so you're the one that goes first in the Nexus no I failed I've not I've not fucking I've, <laughs> that's what I'm I've, I've, I've tried and you then fell asleep. Fe- fell asleep I got like two steps and then was like my brain just went into I always go backwards and then kind of like forward type thing so I was like the performing artist was in a performing art film with a, a guy who was in tons of like Madonna music videos so I then got to like him to Madonna I had dinner next to one of Madonna's pals the other night oh. and at the whole time through dinner I was like who is this <laughs> I know her who is this and that's who it was as uh, I'd meant to bring she up. was in Goodfellas wild I mean, I was going to bring up earlier, um, I got really drunk when I was a big drinker and met Kevin Devine's band. Oh. Um, they played at the garage. I like Kevin. And um, I was speaking to his bass player and I was telling him, I was like, oh, I'm a musician, I make music. Like, do you do, do you do, I know you're playing bass, but you like a musician in that yourself? And he was like, yeah. And he told me his name and I wrote it on my hand. And then the next day, and it was, uh, it was one of the founding members of Mercury Ref. <laughs> 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 and I was like, do you do, you do, the, do, you do the music stuff yourself? Didn't, didn't tell him what I think of the singing. <laughs> um, all right, Mark, you or I? Yeah, I'll go first. Uh, so as noted earlier, Bright Eyes covered Elliot Smith. Um, before going solo, Elliot Smith's in a band called Heat Miser. Mm-hmm. Um, the guitarist in Heat Miser was a guy called Neil Gust. Um, By the way, Heat Miser fans, there's a re-release of a whole bunch of their early stuff. I think... Uh, Came across it in a sigh the other day. It's rather smashing looking bit of vinyl. Mm-hmm. Uh, Neil Gust has been a guest on Turned Out a Punk by Damien Abram from Fucked Up, really good podcast. And um, he's done over three hundred episodes. He's had loads of guests from like <laughs> three hundred episodes. Big fucking uh, deal, mate. Um, he said those like like guests from all like not just like music and musicians but like directors and all that as well. Um, one of those guests we've had been, Kyle. We've had Kyle. <laughs> we've got Kyle. <laughs> we've had Grant. We've had Grant. <laughs> These are the these are the household names of tomorrow. Yeah, like Fred West. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of his guests was uh, Jamie Stewart from is it Zoo 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 Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, they're an experimental band. They've done a lot of music. Um, recently, they've I've done a lot of music. <laughs> lot of, yeah, a lot of music. <laughs> so, son, Kyle would say the guy from Mercury. Then. Wait a second. I'm just going, <laughs> talking about a lot of music. You should, the next connection is a lot of music. Uh, they've done a collaboration with Mersbow. Uh huh. Who's done a lot of fucking music? He's done a lot of noise. <laughs> yeah, he's, I think he's released like in excess of 500 records or something. Yeah, like that. but yeah, when, it, when yeah. you're just recording static, that's fucking easy. Yeah, so. again, we, we, we went down the guy need by voices route. Yeah. yeah, come back when you're writing a uh, dynamite melody every time. No, I mean, guided <laughs> guide by voices have to at least agree on when to start, stop, and what notes to play. <laughs> Mersbo just doesn't. Mersbo just unplugs the cable and chews it for a while and then yeah. puts it out as an album. Um, in 2020, I believe, he did a collaboration record with Mike Patton called Maldor, M-A-L-D-O-R-O-R, Maldor, um, okay. Maldor. Um, <laughs> He's put five different sounds, versions of that word. Yeah, I, don't, sounds, I don't fucking know. Sounds good. I don't know. I mean, it's, <laughs> Pronunciation. It's, it's this Mel's bow, so it's not going to sound particularly good. <laughs> in 2008, Mike Patton helped curate the All Tomorrow's Parties Festival. One of the bands that he picked were the No, the no Wave band Teenage Jesus and the Jerks. I was at that. Um, which had Lydia Lynch on guitar and vocals that's the only time they performed since they broke up in 1979 which is pretty cool no I was at it it yeah. was it not that good was it not no I mean the, the festival was pretty good but it had uh, Mike Patton picks Mike Patton projects yeah. and sometimes you're just like why the fuck am I standing down here paying good money to listen <laughs> to broken Mike, fucking just Mike Patton in general <laughs> yeah uh, yeah so in 2011 uh, the performance artist Empress Star um, an artist idealist cabaret performer producer and director 
she's done quite a lot of famous stage shows in America and her career spans 27 years and she performed at the Spill Festival of Performance and a show called Empress Stan Space which was directed by Ron Athey and featured guest performances from Lydia Lunch and Peaches Alright, okay There we go I think actually as well when I done the Madonna thing also for some unknown reason got to like the guy that model Tony Ward I think he's called Tom Ward was in a Lisa Marie Presley video <clears throat> and then it was like Lisa Marie Presley Michael Jackson Macaulay Culkin Surely Macaulay Culkin could be related to Bright Eyes in some way, shape, or form. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> like, like, and that was so. This is where Macaulay my... Culkin was in the video for Sunday by Sonic Youth. There we go. You're yeah. pretty much bang on. Oh, we almost did it off the top of our heads. Mm. Instead, I've got a belter, so uh, <laughs> get comfy. Ron Athey, we spoke about Nazis. already. Uh, n- uh, no. <laughs> no, we've got some Jews, but no Nazis. Um, so, Bright Eyes Band. Bright Eyes in brackets band (laughs) The name Bright Eyes It does not come from the lyrics to Total Eclipse of the Heart By Bonnie Tyler Nor does it come from his Art Garfunkel's Mm. Song about rabbits Um, It has nothing to do with that Apparently it's just a compliment But uh, it's also the name of Charlton Heston's Character in Planet of the Apes Bright Eyes Yep from 1968 Again just Kismet I've also been watching all the Planet of the Apes films I'm like four Planet of the Apes deep this week How many baths? I've been watching them at work actually. Oh. So <laughs> having a in bath. my bath, my, yeah. my work doesn't have. How many, bath, how many baths are in them? Oh, one. One. Uh, the play Escape from Planet Apes. They're trying to show like that um, the apes are having like a lovely time. So Zira has like a bubble bath. Okay, that's me. <laughs> Charlton Heston also played Moses in the Ten Commandments. But even odious prick, to be fair. In 1956. Moses? Really? <laughs> <laughs> he, no, put, big, he put the work in. Big Charlie. Anyway, so he played Moses. The original Great Seal of the United States of America, by the way, it's not a seal as in like one that lives in the water. But it's like the, the seal, the big badge <laughs> thing. <laughs> that, the original one featured Moses with his hand outstretched over the Red Sea, closing the waters to destroy the Pharaoh's army. Uh, when the USA declared in the independence in 1770, Six, a committee was set up to design the seal that would be used on all official documents as well as just general merchandising, you know, because like 18th century t shirts were big news. Um, but that heavyweight glamour committee featured Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, and Benjamin Franklin. So it's top shelf celebs yeah. there. Founding um, fathers. For the record, uh, Moses was chosen over Adams' suggestion of Hercules, which uh, Adams himself thought, nah, actually, that's pretty cheesy, apparently. Um, so this, I've, got, I've, I've not seen this, but that, I've, is, is it that, like. Was that a direct quote from, from, from John <laughs> from Adams? John Adams. <laughs> uh, apparently so. <laughs> Bit cheesy, mate. Yeah, that was in the back of the t shirt. I've just um, got this image of like Moses, like, just a, a big hand against the seal. Like. He's, he's almost doing a Nazi salute, so I guess that could be it. But on the picture, yeah, he's got his kind of hand out like this mm-hmm. over the water. Anyway, they, they chose Moses because they also felt that the pharaoh was emblematic of King George of England and obviously declaring independence from the Redcoats, all that kind of stuff. But uh, for the record, in 1783, after three different committees all tried to come to a final decision, that seal was eventually changed in favour of the one with the eagle that you probably recognise from today. You know, the eagle kind of looking off to the side yeah. and the one that's on the front of the plinth and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, Benjamin Franklin, who was part of those uh, committees, uh, is the face of the $100 bill. It's all about the Benjamins. Uh, or at least he should be the face of the $100 bill because in 1992, the band Porno for Pyros, which uh, rose from the ashes of Jane's Addiction, that band came up with a really novel idea for some audience interaction during their live shows when they were touring their debut album in 1993. They printed up fake $100 bills featuring Perry Farrell's face, the singer's face, instead of Benjamin Franklin, and they would hand them out at the, at the gigs during this song. And one fan apparently successfully used the fake note to pay for his meal at a Denny's in, <laughs> in Tampa, Florida after the Tampa show. Um, the restaurant reported it, and the feds arrived, they held interviews, they took the note, and the next day, just before the show in Miami, the band was arrested and detained for counterfeiting. <laughs> <laughs> Bear in mind, this is notes with Perry Farrell's face instead of Benjamin Franklin, and apparently they were like dead papery bullshit, so they were eventually released without charge after hours of being detained, and their manager publicly made a joke about it. they were all going to go to Denny's instead to get dinner and spend the last of their fake notes. <laughs> Um, so the 1994 song Sadness by uh, Porno for Pyros (laughs) 
was actually re-recorded and re-released as A Little Sadness. Uh, and there was a, a new video made for it And the controversial video uh, was made under the art direction of Mr Ron Athey The performance artist uh, He adapted one of his productions called Four Scenes from a Harsh Life And he also included the bit where they called it the human pr- printing press Where they cut symbols in a guy's back And then press fabric on it to sort of create these blood images Now this was actually part of like what got him in a lot of hot water That that exact production led to a dispute with what they called the NEA4 which was a group of ultra conservative culture warrior figures in the 1990s USA who were pushing back basically against any sort of public funding for work that they felt promoted LGBTQ lifestyles and they also had this thing it was uh, Jerry Falwell, some, one of those kind of guys, the, the headlines in the paper were this print and press thing exposed the entire audience to HIV infected blood. I remember reading about that bit actually yeah so uh, that was a big deal but yeah so uh, Ron Athey was brought in to art direct that Porno for Pyros video Ooh. nice Next is complete. that was pretty good yeah well thank you for joining us Kyle hopefully it's not been too torturous for you no thank you for having me it was good to get into bright eyes yeah, and it's I good to get that. out of bright eyes yeah, as well. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Mark, what are we going to cover for the next episode? I don't know Chris, it's your choice Oh, funnily enough, we are going to cover Fever Ray Fever Ray Mark Kyle, while you're here, would you like to pull a name from that little tub there for the Nexus? Yep <laughs> Prove it's real Fully effects there <laughs> Let's Good see. luck reading this Ugh. Yeah it is a German name, I'm assuming, so it's Rudolf van Hackel. That's that's it. It's exactly as the boy says it. Uh, Rudolf von Hackelheber, uh, courtesy of Kenny Banella. Who is it? <laughs> Cryptonomicon, Rudolf Rudy von Hackelheber, a non-Nazi German. <laughs> oh, there are a few that I've, I've heard. <laughs> what an incredibly insulting synopsis there. So yeah. he's a character in a book called Cry- Cryptonomicon, okay. uh, which is a 1989 novel by American author Neil Stevenson, set in two oh. different time periods. Maybe the challenge would be for me to do this Nexus and not mention Nazis. That should be the challenge. Okay, yeah. let's make it so. Yeah, okay. Okay, see you next week. Thanks a lot, Kev. Bye. Thank you, babe. At Arizona State University, we offer a wide variety of degree programs online to match all kinds of interests and career aspirations. Programs that are taught by the same notable faculty who teach on campus and designed using innovative technology to improve learning outcomes and equip you for post-graduation success. That's why 87% of ASU online graduates indicated they were promoted at work or received an increase in salary after earning their degree. Find your program at asuonline.asu.edu. Walmart Plus members save on meeting up with friends. Save on having them over for dinner with free delivery with no hidden fees or markups. That's groceries plus napkins plus that vegetable chopper to make things a bit easier. Plus, members save on gas to go meet them in their neck of the woods. Plus, when you're ready for the ultimate sign of friendship, start a show together with your included Paramount Plus subscription. Walmart Plus members save on this plus so much more. Start a 30-day free trial at walmartplus.com. Paramount Plus, a central plan only. Separate registration required. See Walmart Plus terms and conditions.